Hey, Blake T. Wild here, and I know I said I'd cover an issue of Squadron Supreme each month, and then I immediately messed that up by not doing so. Look, I forgot how many days there are. Time just got away from me. 30 days has September, so on and so forth, you know. But here we are in May, and it's going to be a ultimate squadron sandwich because don't forget it is the year of the ultimate or the ultimate year or whatever i said that i proclaimed it will be where i'm covering just a bunch of ultimate marvel comics in attempt to get through the whole ultimate universe and this month it's gonna be nice squadron supreme buns on either side with two husky slightly smelly but taste surprisingly all right pieces of ultimate marvel comics meat in the middle Released in 1985, written by Mark Grunewald with pencils by Bob Hall, inks by John Beatty, and colors by Christy Scheel. This is Squadron Supreme 3, Showdown. I'm Power Princess of the Squadron Supreme. If I'd been anyone else, I'd be dead right now. But not everyone is as strong or as fast as me. But everyone deserves to be free from the fears of guns and other lethal weapons as I am. That's why the Squadron Supreme, in conjunction with the new political administration, has been hard at work finding ways to make the world a safer place. Already we have begun a program that by December will replace all guns and armaments used by the U.S. military and the nation's law enforcement agencies with non-lethal substitutes. But that alone is not enough. We need your cooperation to help America kick the gun habit. That's a wrap. Great job, Power Princess. Everyone on set relaxes, and as Zarda, a.k.a. Power Princess, leans over to help one of the stuntmen playing a soldier from the ground, the scumbag that is Dr. Spectrum takes a look at her and thinks to himself that Zarda has been taking herself a bit too seriously recently. Then he uses his power prism to control a beam of focused light across the room, tearing her outfit straps, causing her to flash everyone that's in front of her. Everyone in the studio stands in awkward silence as Doc Spectrum is like, <laughs> come on, that was hilarious. You know, he's one of those guys. Zarda marches over, lifts him up with one of her Amazonian hands. Oh, to be hoisted aloft single-handedly by a tall, muscular woman. Uh, anyway, she says that while she and her fellow utopians were taught that the body is a temple of the soul and modesty was something unnatural, she clearly understands that Spectrum's actions were meant to publicly ridicule her, so she rips off his dumb cape and drapes it over herself as she says that he will one day regret his irresponsibility. Then she enters the broadcast room and meets the new president, President Jules Gardner. An amalgamation, clearly from the name, of Julius Schwartz and Gardner Fox, two huge names in DC comics and comic history, uh, really the uh, kind of almost architects of the Silver Age in a way. Uh, and he mostly does resemble Gardner Fox. It just really hammers home the fact how much of a Justice League DC fan Mark Grunewald was. The president tells her that he's still uncertain of how the disarmament program will play out, what with the right to bear arms in the Constitution and the chaos of the previous administration, and he asks if she thinks it'll actually help stem lawlessness. And Zarda explains that people are the ones who kill, not guns. But the program will make it much harder for people to kill. And this is just phase one of their crime prevention program. We'll see where it goes pretty soon. Later at the temporary Squadron Supreme headquarters at the Wrangley Mountain range of Moorland, Dr. Spectrum recounts the look on Zarda's face as he and Golden Archer snicker and laugh. And he also explains that the cameras were still filming and he bribed a member of the crew to send him a tape. As the Wizard, not at all entertained by Doc Spectrum's sexual harassment, uncomfortably tells him that he went too far. Golden Archer tells the Wizard to stuff it as Power Princess silently marches down the corridor and Spectrum and Archer make snide remarks at her. Later during the squadron's meeting, Zarda reports her activities, not reporting what Spectrum did to her. 
Hyperion then announces that every gun and ammunition factory in America has been shut down. Golden Archer and Lady Lark discuss their appearance in Angelopolis, and eventually, after the rest of the reports are in, Hyperion brings up Nuke. Wizard offers up his services as the world's fastest man to hunt down where their missing cohort is, but then Power Princess volunteers Dr. Spectrum. Since he and Nuke have been, like, buddies in the past, they've gone out on the town drinking and just hanging out after work, essentially, and he'd have a better idea of knowing where Nuke would be. Spectrum corrects her by saying that he and the kid only went out drinking once or twice, but he stopped because Nuke was just too annoying. Then he realizes that Hyperion isn't gonna let him out of this, so he reluctantly agrees. And later, the meeting is adjourned and Tom Thumb comes up to Spectrum and explains the whole n situation with Nuke's parents and suggests that Doc check out the hospitals. So later, Spectrum soars across the night sky to Motor City, Wyandotta, hoping that he can find the little punk kid and get this over with quickly. He soars through Motor City, heading to the suburbs that he vaguely remembers Nuke showing him when they stopped by his home one night. And on his way, he discovers a massive glowing crater in the middle of a field. Meanwhile, back at Squadron HQ, the members all sleep in their co-ed dormitory, and yes, <laughs> the amphibian does sleep in a giant tank of water when he's on land. Everyone except for Wizzer is asleep, because he has to put himself into a hypometabolic trance to suppress his extreme metabolism. And then the alarm blares off, calling for himself, Amphibian, and Arcana. They make their way to the control room, and Tom Thumb alerts the trio that a gun factory in Westinger, which looks to be this world's equivalent of Texas, is being raided by looters. Meanwhile, Dr. Spectrum arrives at a hospital. He introduces himself to the cute girl at the front desk and explains that he's looking for Gilbert and Florence Gaines. She looks them up in the system, and unfortunately, tells him that they passed away last month on June 18th and the 21st. Spectrum then thanks her and leaves. Realizing that Nuke has been in mourning this whole time, Doc then flies to the address of Nuke's parents. Meanwhile, in the night sky near the Olmstead border of Westinger, the trio of Squadroneers race through the sky for Alamo Town. They arrive at the factory and discover the crowd out in full force. Wizard and Arcana tell Amphibian, you know, the water guy in the middle of not Texas, to find a place to park their pseudo fantastic car. And as the duo leap off the vehicle and plummet through the air, guided by Arcana's magic, Wizard realizes that this may have not been a great idea. Because then the rioters start shooting at them. And then we get this incredible panel which just perfectly shows the wizard activating his hyper-accelerated senses as he watches the bullets slow to a near halt. It's so insanely well done. This panel just expertly depicts the actual reduction of time in a comic, in a 2D medium. It's like the Quicksilver scene from Days of Future Past. I love this panel. Wizard is able to block or move each bullet's trajectory, and as Arcana lands them, he tells her that he'll be back, before realizing that because he's going so fast, all she or anyone nearby is going to hear is just a high-pitched bleep that just goes by real fast. Then he whizzes through the nearby mob, and Arcana uses her abilities to cause a gust of magical wind to relinquish every firearm. Then the wizard does his thing and collects every weapon and begins disassembling them into their most minor of pieces. This episode is brought to you by my Patreon and my comics, Destructo Boy and The Custodian's Agents of Cross. Each issue of The Custodian's Agents of Cross is over 60 pages of pure comics, written, illustrated, colored, lettered, designed. Everything you see in these books was created entirely by myself. And this is asks the all-important question, what if the only heroes that can save the world are an intelligent baboon, a girl who controls fire, the world's smartest man with the power of elasticity only in his right arm, and a four-armed werewolf? And this just follows their exploits. Like I said, it is a love letter to the 60s, Silver Age, and to all of comics in general. As you'll see as the series progresses to its sixth and final issue, this entire first issue, however, is posted in its entirety on my Patreon, patreon.com slash smokiesvideos, where you can read the entire thing for only two bucks. Normally this book, I sell it for $15, which already is a far better deal than anything you're getting from Marvel or DC these days, but as little as $2 a month, you can get access to the entire issue. 
and I am serializing issue 2 as we speak. But that's not all, because I also have my sci-fi, zany, just crazy fun series, fun for the whole family, all-age comic, Destructo Boy. Destructo Boy follows this little robot guy right here as he lives on a giant space station in the far-flung future, and he battles crime, giant robots, giant monsters, and evil conquerors from space, such as Grimlax the Astro Knight. Each of these issues just introduces as much zany sci-fi craziness as I could fit into these books. They're being serialized on my Patreon as I speak as well, and you can pick up all five issues on my Etsy shop, BlakeTWild.Etsy.com. Back outside of Motor City, Spectrum meets Nuke's younger brother, Scotty, who was left in a neighbor's care after his parents were taken to the hospital. Scotty has the time of his life as he fawns over meeting a real member of the Squadron Supreme. And as he explains that while he does have a complete set of Squadron action figures, he has two Dr. Spectrum action figures, because he is his favorite. Oh, Scotty, if only you knew. This is like the boys before the boys. <laughs> Spectrum then tells him that he's looking for his brother Nuke, and Scotty says that he may have an idea of where his older brother Al is, but he wants to fly with Dr. Spectrum to look for him. So Doc forms a little rocket for Scotty to ride in, and they head to a cemetery. And Scotty confusingly wait, makes his way through the dark cemetery, which the coloring on this is not the best. It really just, I can't remember what it looks like in the original issue, if it's properly colored like a knight's scene or not. I don't think it is, but this, like, sort of digital upgraded recolory, it, 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 it looks like it's the middle of the goddamn day. It's supposed to be in the middle of the night. Anyway, Scotty m confusingly makes his way through the dark cemetery until they spot Nuke sitting before the Gaines plot. And this rendition of Nuke in this one panel looks so much like 90s, 2000s Frank Miller. I love it. And this was 1984. This was like right when Miller would be doing um, Ronin. So are they, is Bob Hall, was he seeing what Frank Miller was doing in Ronin and digging that and decided to add a bit and piece here and there? Because there's like one or two other panels in this book that look distinctly Miller. But I just, I love this because it just looks so much like that late sort of period Frank Miller that I unironically love. <laughs> anyway, Scotty starts calling out to his brother in excitement when Nuke shouts at Spectrum for bringing his brother into this. And Spectrum immediately notices that Nuke ain't looking so good. <laughs> Why are you butting into my life? You don't care about me. None of you did. You're one of the Squadron Supreme. We take care of our own. Like hell you do. I don't want your pity, Spectrum. It's all your fault this happened. Kid, what the hell are you talking about? Tom Thumb! He had the ability to save them, but that goddamn midget refused. He killed them. Now take Scotty home and leave me alone. Whoa, hey. Chill out, Nuki. I'm here to help you. Come on. Let's go get a beer Forget like this. Forget it! I've had it with you and your phony crap! Whoa! Hold it! I was willing to let your crazy slide, kid. I know you've been through a lot, but now you're threatening folks and trashing the place? I don't care! I'm gonna kill that dwarf before you or anyone else stops me! Spectrum prepares to fly after Nuke, but then realizes that he has to return Scotty home. He tells the young boy that he'll make sure that his brother doesn't hurt himself or anyone else. And then he soars away. Fifteen minutes later, he finally finds Nuke soaring across the night sky like a fireball. And Spectrum narrowly encases him with a power bubble. But Nuke destroys it in another Frank Miller-esque panel. If you keep messing with me, I'll waste you too, old man. Old oh, man... What's the matter, Smack? You thought one arm was something? Dig this! Stop fighting me, Nuke! Concentrate! Make the spear stick and come on! Yeah! Yeah, I think I did it. I don't feel the force of his blasts anymore. He's trying to fake me out or something. Oh god, oh god, he's not faking, and if he is, he's doing a great job out of Hell, is he even breathing? Did he burn up all the air inside the bubble? Nuke, 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 no, come on. 
Come on, don't do this. Breathe. Breathe. No, please, breathe. Wake up, kid. Come on. Uh, come on, Albert. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. Come on. Wake up. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I, I killed him. I, I, I didn't... I didn't mean... That... Well, that's... Oh, what's the use? Who's ever gonna believe that this was actually an accident? Maybe if I just... Maybe if I just leave him somewhere... Tell the squadron I couldn't find him. God damn it, I'd never live with myself if I did that. I'm gonna have to own up to this. Oh, Christ. Later, Spectrum returns to find Hyperion, Zarda, and Tom. He places Nuke's body on their meeting table and wrenches out that he killed him. Spectrum falls to the ground, saying that he didn't mean it. But Nuke had truly gone off the deep end and was threatening to kill Tom and anyone else who tried to stop him. Zarda then embraces him and says that they know he didn't mean for this to be the outcome. And two days later, Spectrum arrives to find Scotty playing with his squadron toys. Scotty says that he got a new action figure set to replace his old worn out ones. And then... Dr. Spectrum says that he needs to tell him something about his brother. And Scotty asks if he died fighting a supervillain. And Dr. Spectrum has to explain that Albert Gaines died fighting him, a fellow superhero. And Spectrum used too much force trying to stop him. Scotty says that his brother was acting all weird and probably had it coming and that he wasn't a very good superhero. But Spectrum says that Albert was a good hero. The end. Well, that was depressing. Uh, it's only going to get more so in a variety of ways as we continue the coverage of Squadron Supreme. Don't you worry, uh, it's gonna get darker. <laughs> There's a reason why people liken this to uh, Watchmen, even though this came out just before Watchmen. Um, it, it's... Oh, God, there's... Next issue has something really fucked up in it, like, just morally corrupted people <laughs> taking advantage of others and it's it's just going downhill at this point this is fully i believe this is the 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 watershed moment this is the uh, event horizon if you will the point of no return for this cast of characters uh at this point this is the final time that they could have you know, turned this whole story around in some way, or really done something within this past month that has occurred between issues two and three. It happens immediately, as you can tell. Just the first, within the first two, three months, they're already going down a path that they are not going to be able to come back from, and is going to lead to a lot of death and destruction and just ruination of lives. <laughs> And it's, I, I said in the first video, I said in the second video, I've said it in a bunch of other videos, it is without a doubt my favorite comic series ever published by Marvel Comics. I think it's the best Marvel story there's ever been. I absolutely love Mark Grunewald. Uh, I love Bob Hall, the artist of this book. I love Christy Shield, the colorist. I, everything about this is just perfect. And again, it's, uh, it's another subversion of sort of those classical superhero ideas taken to a real life sort of standard and thought process that of the classic superhero punch-up issue it happens in just about every dc or marvel comic from this time and from the 60s and onward and even now we still get them for some reason wow look at that misunderstanding between these two superheroes uh this one is what happens when real life people one of whom is just emotionally distressed and not being taken care of mentally and is going through mental distress is going up against someone who they see as it's almost like nuke very much has like a, a mental break there you go mental breakdown between these issues in the past month since his parents died and it, it exacerbated by the fact that it is his fault because he exudes nuclear energy and they died of uh, cancer so that just uh, toppled on everything and now as you can see he starts thinking of the squadron like he gets super paranoid too he uh, uh spectrum in his like inner thoughts he says like jesus christ he looks like he hasn't like 
bathed in three weeks, and he hasn't eaten in double that time. Uh, he's, like, not taking care of himself. He's just fucking probably sitting at the cemetery all night and day until he just passes out from exhaustion. And he thinks that the squadron are now against him because they are, you know, supporting Tom Thumb in a way. So, obviously, they are ha they have some sort of conspiracy theory going on to protect him from Nuke, who knows the truth that Tom is the reason that his parents died, not him. He, Tom could have saved his parents if he wanted to, but he refused because he hates Nuke. You know, he's, it's kind of like Gollum, <laughs> but the way I'm speaking about it. And then you, you get Dr. Spectrum, who is, as we've seen in previous two issues, someone who just really does not take the superheroics seriously. Uh, he's based off of early Hal Jordan, who was a hot shot sort of test pilot. That's kind of what Dr. Spectrum's alter ego was to begin with here as well. Uh, he... The first thing he does, pretty much, after they defeat the Overmind is go back to his trailer that he lives in and ring up a booty call using his power prism to fucking uh, give the phone power after the blackouts that the country was experiencing. So he's not someone who, Zarda says it expertly enough, is that he has an immaturity and a uncaring view of the world uh, and... It's just a very, he has a very selfish view of what it means to be a superhero. And he even, when he's going to find Nuke, he's like, God damn it. How, okay, how do I, <laughs> how do I get this done quick enough to where I can go play some poker? <laughs> that's literally one of his thought processes is, that's one of his reasonings for like getting this done with is that he just wants to go home and hang out with his buddies and play some poker because he's obsessed with poker. It comes up every goddamn issue. It seems like, uh, and that's, he doesn't give a shit. And then he's even at the end after he realizes what he did and it's starting to wash over him, the, the outcome of his actions and nukes actions against him he even has those little inklings like, oh, well, what if I just hide the body? What if I just leave him here and say, hey, I don't know what happened to him. I couldn't find the kid. Oh, well. But uh, Zarda is correct in that he does have to come to terms and accept responsibility. These are both two characters who, as we have seen in the past three issues pretty much refuse to accept responsibility. Uh, in issue two, Nuke refuses, you know, responsibility about his actions and his energy and his powers and relation to his parents. Um, like I said, Dr. Spectrum really doesn't take the heroics seriously. He's showing off. He's hyping up the crowd when they're dropping off rations. He's, he's in it for the limelight. Uh, we don't really know too much about Nuke as, uh, like, a person because we're just immediately thrown in. Uh, to the whole storyline with his parents. But seemingly from the first issue, and the fact that he hangs out with Dr. Spectrum and probably would look up to him as a hero and, a, you know, a colleague, um, possibly a father figure, because Nuke <laughs> does not have many friends or, you know, people to talk to, I'd imagine they have somewhat of a similar view of heroics they they act similarly they're both very brash they're both very abrasive um i think that they both agree with um hyperion at the very first issue when he's talking about how they need to like you know take control of everything they're like two of the first guys to sort of raise their hands in agreement during the vote so just that aspect of them they're they're definitely not the worst character in the squadron. We're going to see who the the shittiest human being is next issue. <laughs> but it's, it's just such a fantastic series to just analyze and look over. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. Uh, leave suggestions for any ultimate comics that I need to cover. I, are, I know about Spider-Man. I know about Fantastic Four. Give me the lesser known storylines. Give me the weird X-Men stuff. The weird version of the ultimate avengers or uh you know the, the little side stories like the one where the ultimate punisher is showing up just give me some of those weird ones um as always follow me on instagram at not blake wild check out my patreon patreon.com slash smokies videos for early access to videos when available 
and uh, movie commentaries, behind the scenes stuff. I serialize and post my comics every week on there. And uh, check out my Etsy shop as well for uh, physical copies of my comics. And I will see you next time. Bye.